Yes, then we are set. So I will <coughs> finish this uh, this rail section and um, talk a little bit about freight planning, and then uh, finally uh, air transport. And uh, if we have time, I think we'll have some time for that. We'll discuss some uh, some exam questions, um, and that will also be done on the summary lecture two weeks from now. Um, <coughs> but let's start with rail. Uh, this is a is an old industry. Uh, those ships and and rail sh sea transport and rail transport was sort of kind of rather ancient uh, transport modes, also freight transport modes. I think the first <coughs> railway was built in Norway in 1811 or something like that. It's quite old. Um, tradition for um, public ownership uh, of uh, operators and tracks. And this has now changed a bit, uh, so it will come back to. Uh, today, um, there are, <coughs> um, in many countries, private ownership of, uh, of uh, train operators, whereas the tracks are, uh, in most countries, <laughs> in the hands of the public sector. There was an attempt to privatize, privatize the railways in the UK, <coughs> but after a very bad accident in uh, <coughs> 1998, I think it was, at Paddington Station uh, outside London, where a lot of people were killed, they uh, re-regulated that into public ownership again, because it turned out that uh, lack of maintenance and coordination was, was the cause of, of that accident. Um, Historical index sign for national needs and not cross-border operations. It's a it's a story behind that as well, <coughs> because that has been a problem uh, when it comes to integration between countries. There <coughs> may be problems with uh, systems, signaling systems. Even the type of, of tracks may differ uh, between countries. So if you come to the border and you're going to continue into the neighboring country, you may have problem with the gauge of the, of the, of the, of the rails, uh, <coughs> which is not a big problem anymore in, uh, in Europe. But for instance, on the border between Spain and France in the older days, that was an issue. Very, con uh, very c focused on production, and not so much on uh, on the market side. To get the trains running and to have good equipment and uh, and all that, <coughs> but not that much focus on payload, um, development of uh, of the service level, and so on. It's been a bit lagging behind, but it's uh, it's still. Uh, and that is also <coughs> a thing that is was supposed to change when they uh, when the authorities decided to privatize, uh, at least in uh, in some countries, the train operators to force them to become more market oriented. So apart from the road transport sector, which has always in had uh, <coughs> a large share of private operators. This, this uh, sector has been uh, quite different from that. <coughs> um, the rationale for, uh, for, um, for rail transportation. Um, this, is, this is an international experiences that are sort of uh, merged into, into one table. So we may have national differences, <coughs> but uh, the characteristics is that it serves both passengers and freight markets, as we know. Uh, <coughs> it focuses on, uh, on being a part of an intermodal transport chain. There are cases where you have direct services, uh, where you have a track going from, from supplier to customer, 
but that is normally not the case. So we need to involve uh, other modes of transportation as well, primarily road transport, but also sea transport. Uh, <coughs> quite high capacity in terms of, wa uh, of, uh, of weight. Uh, you have economies of scale, which is an important feature here. Uh, <coughs> big units, high, high load capacity. So, uh, and very low variable costs. So you have this quite extreme uh, case, uh, not as extreme as sea transport perhaps, but since it is so energy efficient, the, the marginal costs of, of one unit is, is very low. Because, I mean, to move the train you need an engine, you need people manning stuff, you need a track, and you need the cars, the wagons. Whether you transport one unit or you transport uh, a full load, costs are more or less the same. So the unit costs are, are very low. As it's said here, it's, a, it's an average <coughs> division here. And uh, you have to remember that this is the variable costs. Um, this is running costs. You have the capital costs in addition, which gives this increasing returns to scale. The capital costs are, are, uh, are quite high. But you have these scale effects, which are then uh, mentioned here. <coughs> But again, if you need to, uh, to do a lot of handling, to, to swap cargo and to, uh, to, uh, to couple and decouple wagons and things like that, you, you, you get quite soon uh, cost increases. Uh, this is, uh, <coughs> it was a very important part of uh, industrialization. Rail transport and uh, industrialization went hand in hand. Now we are back uh, more than a, a century. In the UK and in France, <coughs> the rail system supported industrialization. And they even tried to, to, to use the rail, rail industry to industrialize Norway. The, the, the Brits tried that, but they soon found out that uh, it wasn't enough people to get much out of it, so they sort of decided not to go forward. <coughs> but they actually set up a production plant for locomotives, lo locomotives in, in Trondheim, a bit up north here. And one of them is, uh, is standing outside of the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, produced in Trondheim. I mean, the Brits have done uh, lots of <coughs> strange things when it comes to, to railways. And you find railways all over that island. If you go to Scotland, remote areas, you can feel pretty sure that the train is coming along. And the scale effects are not very much, much used, uh, to say the least. <coughs> Dependent on government subsidies, <coughs> government financed, um, but again, this, uh, this uh, movement from regulation to deregulation. And uh, <coughs> subsidies is uh, kind of a, a, a phenomenon here because we can just show you how that works. I need to turn this light on. Very briefly, <coughs> again, we have this, this economies of scale. We can use this uh, <laughs> type of illustration for a lot of purposes. This is uh, average costs. These are marginal costs. Quantity, <coughs> price, and costs. And you have this demand. You have seen this a lot of times now, D. Um, <coughs> if you um, are able to price according to what gives the highest 
economic, the highest level of economic efficiency. You, should, you know that you should price equal to marginal cost. So the prices should equal the marginal costs, like this. But if you do that, <coughs> what will happen then? You will, because for that volume, you will not earn money, you will lose money, because the price is below the average cost. Because you need at least to have average cost price to be able to go break even. So, to be able to correct for that, you actually need to <coughs> add on this amount of revenue, which is then <coughs> which is then a subsidy. So to be able to produce <coughs> in an equilibrium with price equals marginal cost, you need to have some kind of um, public support as, a, as an operator within this market. So this was the sort of the, the Latin, and it is still in, in a theoretical sense. <coughs> but then, in practice, uh, <coughs> the, the authorities has sort of moved a bit away from this in some markets. And they say that, well, we accept that the operators are charging price equal to average costs, which are the break-even price. What happens then is that you get a slighter reduced volume. The volume is reduced down to QAC. Price is moved up to PAC. And you get <coughs> a kind of loss equal to this triangle which is what we call a dead weight loss. Which is actually an economic efficiency loss. So we see that uh, <coughs> there is a kind of rationale for subsidies. Um, but other, there is, uh, there are problems because subsidies are doing something with the incentive structure. And it is doing something with, uh, let's say, the mindset of, uh, of, the, of the operators. So it's a bit of a two-edged sword, this, uh, this uh, subsidy thing, because it's uh, good if everybody is still productive, given that you receive subsidies. But productivity or efficiency tends to decrease a bit in subsidized systems. You don't get that pressure to produce and to make money because you know that you can you get the deficit from the public authorities, right? So <coughs> during the 1980s, uh, the Thatcher regime in the UK, they firmly believed in this point instead of this point. They privatized quite a lot of, uh, of this structure and left it more or less to the market. So <coughs> what might happen when you privatize systems is that prices go up, demand may be reduced, and uh, you may get... Uh, a kind of economic pressure that can cause, in a system like this, cost savings, which is good, but uh, cost savings at the expense of, uh, of safety is not good. And that is what happened in, uh, in, uh, in the UK. Uh, the, the rail tracks was sold out to different companies. They were running a cost efficiency program. 
they didn't manage to coordinate things. And then suddenly an accident happened at Paddington Station. And I remember it quite well because I, I uh, <coughs> was sitting in the train three days before that accident. And we ran across a big area with a lot of tracks winding themselves through. And it went at a speed of 160 kilometers per hour, I think. And we were sitting like this all the time. And I felt quite unsafe, to be honest. And um, it was not good at all. So then they decided then to re-regulate, as I said, to, to take the rail tracks under public ownership again because the rail tracks is the part of the system with the highest degree of scale effects. I mean, a rail track is very expensive to build and it has a very high capacity. So it's, uh, and such systems <coughs> um, are quite, quite suitable for public ownership. You cannot piece up a rail track and sell it it's a natural monopoly, high costs, <coughs> high capacity, and so on. The rolling stock is much more, let's say, suitable for privatization. Because then you have a capacity flexibility, even if there are economies of scale there as well, you have flexibility in terms of the number of, uh, of uh, wagons and uh, you, have a lot of you have a lot more to play with when it comes to the rolling stock. So there it is less of an issue to, <coughs> to keep that under public ownership. There, here you see just a, <coughs> a very short description again based on, on average international numbers on the, on the market segments. You have <coughs> a description of three segments, single wagon, where as a freight owner, you may, own, may use uh, one or a, or a few wagons for transporting the cargo. Or you may have a full, <coughs> full train or block train, often used for bulk transport. And then you have the intermodal, which is sort of the, the modern way of producing rail services, where you try to coordinate with, with other transport modes. And this is part of, these two are the segments which transport, let's say, more high value goods, value per ton, that is. So <coughs> in, uh, in, uh, in all the EU policy documents, this is the sort of the segment that are discussed, this intermodal transport, to transfer cargo from road to rail and, uh, and use, uh, use it as an intermodal system. In Norway, <coughs> we have uh, three main categories, <coughs> which are container transport between the bigger cities, uh, system solutions, Trimby transport, minerals and jet fuel, and those systems are <coughs> maybe directly a direct rail connection between um, a supplier and a customer. For instance, jet fuel is, is taken from, uh, from Oslo port and to, uh, and to the Oslo main, main airport without any, any <coughs> loading or unloading on the way. And then we have the flexit trains <coughs> with wagons for pallets, cars, and so on, which are suitable for handling, let's say, uh, smaller amounts of, uh, of, of cargo. And it may even be just attached to, <coughs> to a passenger train. So you, you can, from time to time, see a passenger train with one or two uh, cars of uh, cargo wagons in the back, at the back. Container segment counts for 75%. Uh, <coughs> it's, a, it's a major uh, major share. This U should be removed. The container freight counts for even more. And it 
terms of ton kilometer. Um, and uh, <coughs> this is sort of the, let's say, the, the competition here in, in this country goes between uh, containerized tr rail transport and the road transport. So, uh, yeah, so I think that is basically it. You can compare <coughs> different regions in, in, in Europe, uh, the organization. Here, this is what I've tried to, to discuss, uh, the separation of infrastructure from per operation. For accountancy purposes, <coughs> but underlying that statement, accountancy, it is a discussion of incentives to operate according to, to market needs. It is a question of efficiency to have a rail track which operates uh, with an efficient uh, set of uh, user charges for the operators where the public sector can take a larger <coughs> responsibility for the costs, running costs of uh, running and maintaining the tracks as such, whereas the operators are, are more market-based in a way that they need to sort of deal with end customers and things like that. Uh, <coughs> Passenger-oriented, and this is a kind of a problem in, the, in some cases because uh, there may be a conflict of interest between the slots, which is, the, which is a right, right to use the railway in during a certain period of time. The slot capacity may be constrained in some areas <coughs> during some, po some periods of, of the day. In this country, you have a, there is a problem around the Oslo area with the, with the scarcity of, uh, of rail track capacity. And then the passenger trains are given priority. Which of course is of concern uh, when you talk about transferring cargo from, uh, from, from road to rail. Uh, you need to have the capacity at hand. The ownership, <coughs> I've talked about this. Um, Equip equipment and terminals are uh, to a larger extent uh, privatized, whereas the uh, infrastructure is uh, owned by the public. When it comes to <coughs> North America, uh, there are, in that case, private companies and uh, bigger companies taking care of the, of the operations. But even in the US, the public sector has a, has a role when it comes to, uh, to, the, to the tracks themselves. In the US, <coughs> the market focus is, is freight oriented. I, I told you the story about the slow trains. And they can move slowly uh, because there are no no <coughs> significant competition between rail and between passenger and, uh, and freight transport. The freight is given priority there. There are some exceptions. <coughs> there is a line going from Boston to, I think it is from Boston, or maybe from New York to, uh, to Washington and a bit on the East Coast. And you have some of the same uh, along the West Coast where passenger transit is, uh, is given priority. But on a cross-continent basis, the the, fra the, um, the system is uh, is uh, oriented towards freight, private ownership of the companies, and so on. Longer distances, Asia Pacific. They have still <coughs> a lot of uh, public ownership on both sides, both operators and rail track. Um, Japan is sort of different from China in that respect, for, for obvious reasons. But since uh, China is a big player here, in, in Aust Australia you have a different situation with, with uh, <coughs> public 
publicly owned uh, tracks and the private private operators. Focus on passengers, uh, and you have this description. If you talk about railway infrastructure investments and uh, and what we can gain from that. It's always good, and this is, uh, when I show you these slides, you can, of course, read what is, uh, you should read what is written here, but you should also think a bit about how the information is structured. It could be useful when you, when you are going to give overviews or to, to make structure in your, uh, in your own presentations. Here we have <coughs> divided it into stakeholders, groups, public sector, shippers, rail operators. Then <coughs> we have divided the benefit side for the different groups into specific elements for the public sector. They are mentioned here. And then the different benefits are described. So <coughs> when we do economic analysis of this system, uh, we try to address the different benefit groups here and try to, to uh, quantify them. You can quantify the value of highway congestion and maintenance. You can quantify this. You can even quantify this in terms of uh, traffic forecasts, which gives you the link to the to the uh, economic growth issue, and also the environment in terms of uh, changes in energy use and uh, emissions. For the shippers, transit times, lower logistics costs, and improved reliability. This has to do with variance in lead time, which can be quantified and monetized. This can also be quantified and monetized, but even if it's not easy to get and uh, get hold of the information, this is uh, <coughs> this is uh, easier to to try to to quantify. And then the rail operators, increased traffic, improved reliability, and then the different benefits are explained here. I won't go through that. You you can read it, and you can also have it at hand uh, during the exam. This is what I tried to say at the outset here, that there are <coughs> barriers to cross-border rail operations in some cases. Uh, <coughs> but there has been a focus now, and that is a good thing with, uh, let's say, inside the European Union, that uh, there has been a focus on trying to, to align the systems so that you don't get these these uh, these problems. Um, this is still in some areas a problem under investment in railways and rolling stock. So there must be there is a kind of a self reinforcing mechanism here <coughs> because if the market shares decrease and if you then start to decrease the quality and the activity level, what will happen then? Then the market share will increase even further and then the system can, can, uh, can, be, um, can, can be less functional over time. So there is a, there is a th and this is a kind of a similarity with the, with the sea transport industry, that you need to have, you need to make sure that you get the demand for the cargo up to a certain level to make this system work properly. And I'll show you this a bit more in detail. And I'll start with that here now. And it is more, a bit more theoretical, but uh, <coughs> I think it's, uh, it's a good way of illustrating what economists call the critical mass problem in systems we have a high amount of uh, scale effects, and you are competing with uh, with other 
market players that doesn't have this type of scale effects. The road industry doesn't have that kind of scale effects. Because a truck is a very quite small <coughs> small unit as compared to to to, to a rail system. And uh, and the cost functions are quite different. And I'll show you that in a, in a few, few minutes. You can start here with this discussion. And this is uh, quite similar to, to this one. Uh <coughs> the idea behind this is that we have the same demand. We have the marginal costs as constant within the capacity limit. And we have at the outset, if we if we run this system in uh, in a way that it is marginally profitable, we are insisting we have P1, B, X1 as the as the equilibrium. Then the <coughs> the, the P1, the price, is equal to the average costs, and this uh, this uh, operator goes break even. And this operator here may be, let's say, the railway system serving a link going from A to B. And you have a volume of, uh, of cargo which are, uh, are transported on this, uh, on this link. If now <coughs> we are able to make this more efficient, uh, let's say to, uh, to um, to invest in better equipment, we can enter into a situation where this average cost curve is decreasing somewhat. The marginal costs may not decrease. They are very, very small at the outset for, for, uh, for rail transportation. But since, uh, since the, let's say, we can consider it as a throughput per unit of capital costs. So the capital costs go down. So we get the need for a higher price is then sort of reduced because we get a lower average cost. We, got P we get P2 here. And as a result of that, the quantity is increasing. And the quantity is increasing because this of this uh, <coughs> downward sloping demand curve. And uh, and uh, as a result, this system gets a higher throughput, lower costs, and uh, and that is kind of kind of nice. This is a very static picture. We can try to <coughs> tr uh, to transfer this into or this logic into another graph, which looks something like this. And this is valid both for rail transport and for sea transport as compared to road transport. The shapes of the curves may differ a bit, but uh, these curves, these two curves, these two uh, arc curves here, are the same as these two. The AC0, AC1 should be equal to these two curves. With the downward shift, because of efficiency gains. Now, <coughs> the length of this line is the total volume of cargo that goes between A and B. These are the average cost curves for uh, rail transport. And this, but this curve the monotonously increasing curve because yeah this curve goes upwards from right to left and that is a cost curve for road transport very stylized but it is increasing and i will explain you how we should read this uh, diagram in a, in a minute but it is increasing because as you employ more trucks the, the system costs of, uh, let's say, operating a larger number of trucks increases. And 
you can also consider a, a rather dense, densely trafficked road network in terms of capa capacity utilization. So there is a slight amount of congestion that increases with the number of trucks on the road. And as I told you last time, if you have used the road network in, uh, in, uh, on some parts of the European continent at certain times of the day, you see that <laughs> there may, might be a point in this, that when the number of trucks increases in a congested road network, the costs increases with volume like this. It may be like this, it may be have a, s have a let's say, not that high slope, or it may be even higher. That is a kind of an empirical question. But, but for now, just assume that it increases like this. How we should read this <coughs> is that for sea transport, as the volume increases, we move from left to right. As the volume increases, the unit costs go down. We measure costs on the vertical axis. And since, th since this is the total amount that we transport, we can now consider road transport. When the volume of road transport increases, costs go up, and the volume increases in this direction. The point now <coughs> is that to make rail transport competitive in this case. Before we implement the efficiency program, because this was the efficiency program that resulted in a downward shift in the average cost curves. Before we do that, sorry, we need to have cargo a cargo volume, at least at this level, M2, to make the rail system cost competitive with road transport. So this is what we call a critical mass point. Below this point here, the costs of rail transport will be much higher, and you will end up in a situation where everything is taken by road transport. So we need to reach this critical mass point to make rail transport competitive. If not, you will end up in this situation where everything is taken by road. And if this is the point of departure, <coughs> you need to invest quite a lot in various actions to be able to move to, the, to, 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 uh, to, to get to this area, to this, this point. But given that you reach this point, and you're able to attract even more cargo on the, uh, into the rail system, you will follow this curve. And the cost difference between road and rail transport will increase it will be at the largest here, at, but it will still be smaller than for road transport up to this point. So once you pass this point in terms of volume, you may get a self-reinforcing growth in the share of rail transport at the expense of road transport because of the cost difference up to this point. <coughs> so there will still be a, a fraction of road transport left according to this share, right? In the system, because here you have uh, the costs are equal again, and beyond this point, rail are becoming more expensive. If you make the rail system more efficient, you can see what happens. The critical mass point moves to the left. So it's an easier to consolidate enough cargo to reach that critical mass point. 
and you see that the cost difference as you move along within increased volume may also be larger. So the forces for transferring cargo from road transport to rail transport, and as I said, the reasoning is valid also for sea transport, the incentives becomes even stronger. And the point, the intersection point here, moves to the right, so the remaining share of road transport may even go down. <coughs> and I have illustrated this very, in a, in a very, let's say, um, stylized way. We don't know exactly the shape of these curves. The only thing we know is that there is a kind of realism in the shape of these cost functions. We know that there is economies of scale in rail and sea transport. We know that there is not, <coughs> not much economies of scale in the road transport seen as a system. We also know that there, uh, there might be congestion problems. On the other side, <coughs> you may also have congested rail systems, as I mentioned, around Oslo and things like that. So, so this is not easy. You cannot take this graph and say that this is valid for the rail line between A and B at some, some place in the world. But as a, as a theoretical concept, it, uh, it works and, and also in real life it's easy to see that in some places it has, it has relevance. But again you need to sort of be able to say something about the shape of these curves on a case level to be able to, to, to determine where these critical mass points are and the strength in in the incentives to increase volumes sufficiently to, to get a competitive advantage for the rail or sea transport, short sea shipping, primarily transport systems. But it's, it's, it's kind of intuitive if you think about it. If you are able to consolidate a lot of cargo into this system. And if you are left with average cost pricing, you see that if you manage to consolidate, costs will go down. If you can consolidate more, costs will go even further down. And if you then have a, a road system which where the unit costs are increasing continuously because of some kind of capacity constraint or congestion in the system, you can manage to, to get this, to make this system work. It's also uh, quite evident that you need to have a certain volume to make this happen. So the volume needed to reach these points is quite high. So we need to have enough volume to, in to have a, s uh, a decent departure frequency for the rail and, uh, and sea transport systems. So they need to be able to, to depart, depart quite often to be able to, to have a, de uh, a um, lead time which suits end customer needs and all that. So it's not easy. But um, in a way, it's a way of presenting this, uh, this uh, intermodal transport shift problem, which this is actually is a very compact il illustration of. Did you get the reasoning here? <laughs> so so. <laughs> well, uh, just try to work it out for yourself. It's uh, based on the descriptions here. I, I think it should be possible to to get the understanding, and if not, you should just ask. 
uh, by email or coming to my office or whatever I can explain. All right, I think we break there before we go further with freight planning, short session on freight planning.